Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jen Shanger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey, New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, to start, I just wanted to go over a couple of brief housekeeping notes. Um, today's webinar is pre-recorded, but there will be a live chat option when we first air this, so please feel free to ask questions or post your comments. Um, as always, we would love to know more about you. So if you're comfortable, please feel free to let us know a little about yourself in the chat. Um, so now I would like to introduce today's guest. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with Oswin Latimer, who's a lifelong advocate for practices and policies of issues of importance to autistic people. As a recognized expert and leader in the field, they work to empower people to have a voice in the direction and quality of their lives. Their experience in leadership, educating, research, and public advocacy for issues surrounding autistic people have made them a highly respected consultant, public speaker, and presenter, both nationally and locally. Oswin is the founder and president of Foundations for a Divergent Minds and former director of community engagement for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. They have served as a consultant on policy discussion to the U.S. Department of Labor, Department of Education, and Department of Personnel Management. They're also a valued consultant to many parents offering useful and practical advice on how to organize their homes and create individualized education plans that meet the needs of their child. Thank you so much for being here, Oswin. Thank you. It's always so weird to hear my bio because I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. So <laughs> it's true, but I don't believe it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so we're airing this in April, uh, which is Autism Acceptance Month. Um, and we know that April can also be painful for many autistic people for a multitude of reasons. Um, so I'm personally so happy that we were able to time your webinar for now so that we can really get into the nitty gritty of seeing autism through a different lens. Um, and one of, the, one of the themes of your, um, of our conversation today is going to be you kind of breaking down the um, diagnostic criteria. So um, why don't you lead us off with uh, your thoughts? And so when we look at the diagnostic criteria, one of the things that really pops out is the fact that we have to just innately pathologize autistic people. And that means that if you're an adult that's realizing that you're autistic, that you have to suddenly look at yourself in this very negative light in order to even recognize autism in yourself. And so I think that ends up being a barrier for a lot of adults, but it also ends up being a really big barrier for children who are diagnosed because now parents have also had to get into this mindset of these are all things that are wrong with my child. Yeah. Um, and you have to really under, or, and when you, when you go through like the diagnostic process and um, I don't know if my bio mentions that I'm also the parent to two autistic kids. So um, two autistic teenagers. Uh, so I've been doing the parenting <laughs> thing for a while, but when you go through and you um, have to do all of the, evaluations and everything just puts everything in such a negative light mm -hmm. um, that it really affects the way that everyone enters into the world of autism. Um, and when, because we have such a focus on behaviors, I think that's also why we get into, well, the result of that should be behavioral therapy instead of literally anything else. Right. <laughs> um, because we have gotten it in our mindset, well, if we change these behaviors, then you're no longer autistic or you are closer, the whole indistinguishable from your peers thing. And like, I, I don't wanna go too deep into that because I know that 
that's not really the focus of what we're talking about here, but like it's that automatic, well, if these are the characteristics of autism, then these are the things that we can fix. <laughs> right. Ignoring every little thing that causes those things to come into being. All the behaviors become the focus instead of what is underlying that. And I have never really, or there was a point that I could, so back when DSM-5 was being written and um, I happened to be at ASAN at that same time. <laughs> so we did some, we did some advocacy work within the um, diagnostic uh, teams for autism to try and get us to a better criteria than what we were. And so even then, I remember with all the people that were upset that Asperger's was coming out of it and like, right. and saying, and there was the doom and gloom of, well, we're no longer going to qualify for for an autism diagnosis. Like, no, 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 here's where we fall into these negative harmful stereotypes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and how we're gonna continue to be autistic. We're still gonna be able to be diagnosed with this disability. Um, but you have, to, you have to get your head into the mindset of these are the things that you have deficits in, which is so far removed from what being prideful of your neurology even is mm -hmm. um, because you don't see all these things as negative about yourself and um, so like it was always it's always the DSM just forces us into this mindset and it's really really hard to break out of um, and it's taken me so long even for myself to break out of it despite I I recognize that when I say when I get into what I'm talking about people are like wow this is revolutionary I'm like I had to yeah. because I couldn't see myself and I couldn't see my kids and I couldn't see the people around me as this negative ball of goo yes uh you know we um interviewed Mona Delahook a couple of months ago and one of the things she has talked a lot about is that she has to undo a lot of damage because of the DSM, because of the way it frames human beings. And, you know, I, I'm sure many parents relate, I know I do as well, of feeling, um, it's almost like your, your child's or your own existence is just completely pathologized. And it is so much, and to, I'm going to get slightly off subject here, but like my daughter um, is not autistic. She's holistic, but has like all the things that you have adjacent to autism, she has without being autistic. Okay. <laughs> Don't even know how that happened, but it's what <laughs> happened. And we got her diagnostic stuff back from her uh, dyspraxia screening. And everything put her into these really low percentiles for her age, like showed that she was functionally a couple of years younger and all these motor skills than her age. And my, my ex at that point, we were still married, was just so heartbroken by this information that she's has this many deficits. It's like, no, she's, she's still that child that you see over there. <laughs> Yeah, that that's still her. This is just quantifying a few little characteristics of her. This is not this is not bad. This is good. We now have information that we can show, hey, these are the supports you need to have in place. Right. Um, and luckily for like her, the dyspraxia um, um, research really focuses in on the supports and not on fixing because it recognizes Right. The disconnect and right. something that you don't even get to see with autistic people, because despite the fact that a high percentage of, of autistic people are also dyspraxic, um, yeah. you don't even get to see that within anything that we talk about, because everything is a focus on the behavior. So if you won't do something, you 
don't want to instead of you can't. And like right. that whole mindset shifts when you focus in on the behavior. Right. Um, and I, I've just never, uh, it, it took so long to be able to get out of that, um, that I can't even imagine getting back into it, that mindset, <laughs> like, because it's so damaging on so many levels. And, and even within like the autistic community, I think that, um, when we get to try and depathologize, it's really, really hard to do that completely because so many people have put identities around these um, these harmful stereotypes, like yeah, um, identifying stimming as stimming, and I can't do that anymore. Like it, I, I've depathologized that enough that it's like no, 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 that's just body language. We're just it's just body language, and like yeah. everyone's like no, 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 but stimming is great. It's like yes, it is, but like everyone does. <laughs> right. Right. And so getting into even that is really hard to depathologize the way that we think about ourselves, even after we've started to do that work within neurodiversity paradigm. Yeah. There's still this hold on that and like special interests and all these things that are very deeply pathologizing because right. they are things that we don't see as negatives of ourselves. So we're going to reclaim that, but it's still like rooted in this idea that these behaviors are what makes us autistic. <laughs> right. And it's not, that's not what makes us autist autistic. It's our, the way that we experience the world. Right. Makes us autistic. And I think, so the way that autism is diagnosed based on um, based on observation, on a criteria of behaviors, um, but there is no, there's nothing at this point that can look at someone's nervous system. And, you know, these are things, these are technologies that scientists are working on. Um, even, you know, our director, Dr. Torres is very interested in, uh, you know, wearable sensors and, you know, things that help measure the biorhythms so that, and I apologize, my dog is barking, but, um, you know, trying to really understand what the person's nervous system is coping with, what adjustments, you know, it's making. But the way that autism is currently diagnosed, um, I think that that adds a, to a lot of the confusion for people because it is diagnosed behaviorally. And I've been working for some time now to try and figure out how we can even diagnose without going that direction. Um, and what I've come up with, and people can tell me I'm, if this makes sense to them, but um, so far it's made sense to everyone I've talked to about it, is looking at like a three domain area, one being sensory function, Mm -hmm. the next being executive function and then just that sociability and I, I I try to get it as far away from social interaction and social skills as possible because I know that that has so many negative connotations as well but yeah. just the way that we interact socially is I think can be um a light into the way that we um or into our diagnoses um, but I don't know that there's any measures for that, that aren't deficit based on that end, but like our executive functioning and our, and our sensory systems are things that we can really look at. And those things are what, um, and this is how I get into defining it by cognitive function, right? Because like, um, every single diagnostic criteria, <laughs> is a combination of one of those three things. Mm -hmm. um, the adherence to routines is a problem with shifting in executive functioning and initiating in executive functioning. Um, when, if we're talking about um, self-stimulatory behaviors, obviously we're looking at our 
sensory system, but sometimes it can also, especially if we're looking at repetitive ones that maybe are not within our control, we're also looking at the executive functioning of not being able to shift out of that. Um, initiating conversation, again, initiating, like that is not a social piece, that is an executive functioning piece. And we can see that it's, we know that autistic people have a harder time initiating. And then what do we do but give them ABA <laughs> that just exacerbates that initial problem of not being able to initiate and creates right. a prop dependence. Right. Um, right. Which we already have innately. Why are we giving more of that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so like I, I really, every single one of the diagnostic criteria is a combination of one of those three things. And it's not even one singular. It is always a combination of the way that we socialize, the way that we experience our sensory world, and the way that we complete a task. And I'm using task very generally. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, whether it's our interoception mixing with our, with our initiating, or it is our, um, and that can cause problems with like our ability to know when to eat and when to use the bathroom and all, right. Right. like all these little things that we know that autistic people have trouble with, right? That aren't even reflected in the diagnostic criteria. <laughs> no. And same, you know, that has to do with temperature regulation, respiration. I mean, there's a lot of, um, again, there's a lot of underlying nervous system functions going on at all times for all people yeah. that seems to just kind of be overlooked when it comes to an autism diagnosis. Um, exactly. And so like, then we get into people look at the meltdown as a behavior, but no, it's, it's an overloaded cognitive function, right? It isn't an, an it's cognitive overload. It is like the definition of cognitive overload. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To not to have all these things just not match your environment, not match anything. And that's really, really harmful if we don't look at it from that direction because then we're just treating that surface level again. And we really need to be supporting the things that are the mismatch. Right. Um and we don't ever get there because we see it as behavioral and that's really, really harmful. And then we can't, like how many autistic adults don't even know what they need to function in their world? Even the ones that go deep diving into ourselves, like it's, it's so much harder to even learn what it is you need because you've just been told all your life that you need to, and this goes for people that weren't diagnosed as children even, is that you just need to do the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it seems like self-knowledge is so important in self-advocacy and being able to get the things that you need. Because if you don't understand or no one is talking to you about these things, you know, how can you get to a place where you can really ask for the things that you need? And there's some like metacognition research out there that's around that too, about how having that lack of knowledge about yourself can lead to depress depression um, and autistic people, because if they're not aware of the ways that they're different, then it just is like, there's something innately wrong with me. Right. That I can't fix that there. And I don't even know what's wrong with me. Um, and it leads to depression. On the flip side of that, though, um, if you are aware, then you have a much higher likeliness of ending up with anxiety. Is that is what that research also found? Because you're constantly not being able to get your needs met. And so that's anxiety provoking when you're trying to when you're trying to do that. And it's really so like from a mental health standpoint. It's not just the self-awareness at that point. It's also advocating for your needs so that you know that you can have them met. <laughs> right. 
And then uh, in addition, not having those needs pathologized, right. and having them be actually appropriate. Exactly. And so like all of this goes together in, in the way that we have, and we can show how the just the way the autism diagnosis and treatment is set up is going to cause mental health outcomes either direction because we yeah. don't see these things as needs. Right. And do you think uh, do you think this is related to autistic burnout? I mean, there has been recent research on this, um, but what are your thoughts on that? I so I think a large part of it does contribute to um, autistic burnout because um, one, if we are able to, and I want to be very specific that if we're able to, because I don't think you see burnout in people that can't mask nearly as much as you can and those yeah. can mask um, because you don't have that kind of load to worry about um but it it leads into that somewhat um because we're expected to perform neurotypicality um and we don't know if we don't know why then again depression if we do know why then anxiety and then if we figure it out we don't necessarily get to stop. <laughs> um, Judy right. Endow had, you know, Judy Endow is, it can sometimes be a little bit of, a little problematic with some of the things that she's written. But as she's gotten older and has seen the effects of that, um, she, she first started out saying, well, masking is okay because it got me this to this point. But okay. now even her writing is like, and now I have to keep on getting better and I'm burning out because of it. Wow. Like even Judy Indow goes through and says that. <laughs> and that's saying a lot about where we are with expectations from society to perform without any idea of what we need for support. And so from that angle, especially, um, we just know that we need to perform and then what? We right. still have to, we're just given that, here's what we need, what you, what you need to do to look typical. Right. This is what you need to do to perform this. This is what you need to do to have a job. This is what you need to do <laughs> to have relationships. <laughs> yeah. And none of those people know how to support. So what are you, what are some things that you think are helpful? So what's ironic here, and I'm going to go, I'm going to start off by saying this is ironic, is that a lot of the strategies that are used with autistic people mm -hmm. are beneficial. They're just coming from the wrong direction. And then there ends up being this heavy laden, um, here's your cookie for performing it. <laughs> um, but like first then schedules. I mean, it shouldn't be first the boring thing, then the reward. Right. It should just be first we're doing this and then we're doing this because that helps prime our minds that, hey, there's something else coming after this. Right. And this is what that is so that our brain can start to mentally prepare for that shift. Right. Giving wait time is seen as a way to give somebody control, but it actually is more, of, here's what we need to organize our, our bodies and our minds to the next thing. <laughs> right. And maybe even to respond motorically. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what I mean by planning, like is, <laughs> is motor planning like that, that can be hard. Yeah. Um, having timers and such to help with the initiation of the next thing. It's not there to 
again, it's always seen as this way of helping somebody to control their environment. No, 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 that, that is just there. So that it prompts me <laughs> because right. I prompt myself. Right. My brain doesn't prompt me. So here's what I need to prompt. Um, one of the ways that this can look in um, business environments is having somebody in meetings that you can say, hey, can you prompt me when you can tell I'm wanting to speak up? Right. Just having that support person inside inside those meetings. Like it doesn't even have, this isn't, these supports don't even have to be about children. They can be about adults too. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and honestly, we all use, like we're all interdependent in yes. a lot of ways. And so it, again, it's like normalizing that, that some people need you know, more maybe that. more <laughs> and others need less. And it may vary depending on the day or the time of day or what's going on. Exactly. And so like, it's always like fascinating to me that we don't think of it in these terms um, that like, I'm sitting here and nobody can see that in my lap, I have my squishy. <laughs> and I have my twirly um, because nobody stems up here anyways right. with these kinds of things. I'm rubbing my fingers together on my lap. And like we do this because this is what we need to get movement in or like right now I'm incredibly anxious because I don't think I deserve to be here. <laughs> I, I promise you, you do. <laughs> I, okay. I, I, everyone else has told me that. So I'm believing everyone else because clearly my idea of myself is not on par <laughs> with everyone else. <laughs> so like I'm using squish, squishy because I need squishy to, to keep my anxiety from going down. Whereas right. I use this one continuously, like right. without being anxious. I like my continuous spinning. Right. Um, and those are not things that you should have to earn. Those are things that should just be there to have as neat yeah as yeah. needed and like I've got a whole shelf of just stem toys inside my uh, office <laughs> and because I get to choose what I have and what I use and like like it shouldn't be that you have to go to a different area to get these things right like I tried for the longest to get the staff at my kids school to let one of them use their body sock in the classroom and nobody would sign off on it because it's distracting apparently but that shouldn't be something that he has to go down right to a resource room to access that shouldn't be a thing right um and much of the time it seems that um the, one of the most important things is being proactive instead of reactive. Exactly. Um, having, like, I knew to bring these into here because I knew I was going to need them. Yeah. And I could automatically just start doing it. I didn't have to go run down and get it because I realized after the fact that I was anxious, it was, hey, this is going to be a little stressful. I'm going to bring these in with me. Right. Um, and I... Like, even when I worked at ASN, I would bring my, my toys with me to meetings every single time. And like, right. at first I was a little self-conscious about it. I realized I'm the only adult bringing toys into this meeting. And somebody was like, no, 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 that's not a toy. That is something you need for your disability. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a tool. It's a tool. It is not a toy. And like having other disabled people say, hey, no, this is this is perfectly reasonable. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have my wheelchair. Right. Right. I wouldn't be able to be here without my fidgets. Yeah. Um, and like getting into that like mindset of disabled is not wrong was probably the best part of the learning experience of being at ASN was just being around disabled people who were not ashamed of that. Like we have been taught to be ashamed of the fact that we're autistic. Right. Even if we get to the point of being prideful of it, it's still all of those things that society has taught us 
well, that makes you look different. That behavior makes you look different, not that support need makes you look different. Right. Um, So finding all those ways that we can support somebody is so, is so big. Um, But first we have to get out of that pathology mindset and into this is not what's not working in our environments. Right. And it's because there are, you know, nervous system differences and nervous system. Dr. Torres has talked a lot about the adaptations that all of our nervous systems do. And that actually autistic people have amazingly adaptive nervous systems because there are little, you know, little differences. And so, you know, when your nervous system is wired differently from like, you know, an holistic person, it is literally accommodating and adapting more than, you know, a nervous system that's wired a little, you know, more, more typically. And so, yeah, this is what I have to tell autistic people that are just coming into recognizing that they're autistic and have those deep depressions about not being able to do the thing like no 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 your body is already doing way more yes than anyone yes. else you are functioning at a much higher level your brain is because you are not able to turn off those sounds you're not right. able to turn off those visuals that their brains just do automatically they just turn right. them off you're not processing them anymore I'm like how do you not do that <laughs> because it's there they're clearly there right right um and so- you know it's it's not like you know for as an holistic person um you know I don't even notice that my brain is doing certain things yeah. and and so it doesn't it doesn't take any extra cognitive load. It doesn't tire me out anymore. But, you know, for anyone who whose wiring is is different, like it's going to to tire you a little more. I've been an, an really, holistic person. I've been really encouraging. Um, so I do besides FDM, I'm doing consulting work specifically with BCBAs to help them understand these things that obviously no one ever has any education in this. Yeah, realm like that's just just not the way that autism is taught in schools. Period. Right. Um, so, but like going through and really encouraging them that when they start seeing dysregulation in a child, to do the five senses grounding exercise, just to figure out what the sensory experience is in the room right now, because like you tune it out, and so you're not in the present, okay. like that child is. Right. Um, so five things that you can see, four things that you can feel, um, three things that you can, sorry, wait, it's feel, hear, see, smell, and taste. Okay. And like going through those five things to just figure out what the environment's doing because nobody, because your body doesn't naturally do that. You're going to have to force it to figure out like what's happening in that moment. Right. Um, And then because I'm sure everyone's been meeting or maybe not, maybe this is unique to me (laughs) (laughs) where, because I'll say, well, I can't focus right now because the screen is jumping because there's a little bit of vibration in, in the screen. Okay. And then people like, well, I didn't even notice that, but now I can't stop unseeing it. Right. So Here's, once you drew attention to it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like it was, it was there and sounds the same thing because I can't tune those things out. I'm like, this is having, this is making me have a hard time focusing. Can we wait until this is through or can we do something different to make sure? Because like a specific instance of that one was it was during passing periods inside the school with an IEP meeting and there were right. kids walking upstairs and it was just enough to make a little bit of vibration into the screen. It wasn't right. a lot, but it was just that tiny little bit. And so we would have to pause every time that there was a passing period because I couldn't with the sounds and the vibrations that were happening within 
the school environment. Even if it wasn't happening in that room, it was happening in that school environment and it was affecting all the sensory information that I was getting in. Right. And, you know, um, again, I know I'm talking about a lot of Dr. Torres's work, but I, because I really think having this self-knowledge and having this knowledge about, you know, if you have autistic children is very important in advocating for yourselves, but, um, you know, our nervous systems have efferent feedback, which is the information from the brain to the body. And then afferent is the information from the environment back, you know, to the brain. Um, and so a lot of what she has researched is that it's the afferent feedback that is affected in autism. And so the information coming from the environment and, and from your own bodies, um, might, it, it has almost more, um, like noise than, you know, a neurotypical system. And so, you know, understanding that and, you know, how, how might that cause more anxiety or, um, you know, difficulty with movement and sensory processing and all of those important things. Um, you know, this, this type of knowledge and really understanding, um, and one other thing, uh, we had done a survey, I think about two years ago now, and it found that in New Jersey, 80% of people approximately 80%, because I'm saying this from memory, but, um, (laughs) thought that autism is a behavioral disorder. Yeah. And so that disconnect is really, it's huge. Yeah. It's the biggest thing because like you can't ever get to a point that you are supported if everyone thinks about it as behavioral. Right. Because then it just looks like You know, let me change the way I'm going to say that (laughs) because the words are not coming that direction, but they're coming from a different direction. (laughs) Um, Because this is the way my brain processes things. Um, (laughs) It is that I can tell somebody that these are the things that a person needs to be supported. And the first thing that will come is, but what about the explosive meltdowns? Right. Right. Well, what we're talking about will prevent those, but that's not the focus. Right. Right. You need to go to the cause. Yeah. Like it will help those things. And like, you can still measure and track that and all that sort of stuff, but like, what you're actually doing is preventing the things that are causing that trauma sure. response. Yes. And like, I, I really, really have gotten to where I'm trying to frame this all as a trauma response because that's what it is, because it's ongoing environmental trauma. It's not, and I know that a lot of parents don't like hearing that their kids are being traumatized at all moments, but their kid is being traumatized at all moments because you can't shut off your environment. Right. And that can be traumatic because it can cause physical pain, physical discomfort, and you can't escape it. So like that loss of control. Yeah. Is what creates the trauma, not saying that anybody around the person is even being abusive or anything like that, just baseline your environment is. Yeah. And that's really hard to wrap your head around, but then you can start to see, once you see it that way, that meltdowns are your fight response. Eloping is your flight response. Mm -hmm. Hiding under your table is a freeze response. And then going along with what everyone else says you need to do with your behavior is a fawn response. Right. Right, which I think is a really important point because people kind of forget about that. Yeah. About fawn as an option. Yes. Yeah. Like 
if we can recognize the tra the trauma of the environment, then we know that that's that's the response that we're trying to go for when we're just trying to curb the behavior, the end behavior. Right. And nobody wants that. Like, that's a really bad thing to do. Everyone knows that you shouldn't ever fawn if you know anything about trauma responses like that. That is like deep-seated um, trauma responses that aren't even part of like the initial ones that we, we get from evolution. <laughs> that is something unique to, to the way that we have now been socialized to respond to trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so I mean, <laughs> sorry, that was really deeper than probably. No, it's, I, you know, it's really important to talk about these things because we can't, we can't pretend it's not there and we can't just sweep it under the rug because, you know, this is real experiences and yeah. we need to, we need to understand it so that we can better support. And, um, so, and, and, you know, these relational neuroscience has made a lot of, um, progress in, in understanding, you know, the, uh, the interactions of dyadic relationships and, um, you know, how, how important responsiveness in, in the others around the person is for co-regulation and, um, feeling a sense of safety, um, at which, uh, I'll just plug this right now is <laughs> we're going to have Dr. Stephen Porges in May, which I'm really excited about. Um, because, you know, he studies polyvagal theory or created polyvagal theory. And, you know, it's a lot about those feelings of safety. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so what are your other, what's your other advice for people in order to create those feelings of safety? Um, one, okay, so it's going to be different depending on the age of the child, right? Because it depends on how much we've experienced already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so like it's, that's a, that's a big question because we've got so many different entry points of people. So if you're talking about early childhood, mm -hmm. then always supporting whatever your child is reacting to like never ever discount what they are saying right or experiencing or expressing or showing in their behavior showing. always always respond to that in kindness because most adults can't regulate their emotions when they're bombarded mm -hmm. and we're expecting a two-year-old to right <laughs> two-year-olds aren't capable of doing it any two-year-old's not capable no. of doing it, <laughs> let alone an autistic one that's getting all this information in. Yeah. So always respond in kind um, to those to anything that a young child is doing. It's not coddling. It's not like right. there's no such thing as coddling. <laughs> right. I agree. Um, that goes for any any child. That, there's no such thing as coddling. Um. Can we get to the point that we are preventing progress? Yes, but that is different than, than coddling. Um, mm -hmm. When we get into those uh, elementary years where especially kids are now, everyone around the child is probably trying to focus on that behavior because mm -hmm. at that point, we are now in, knee deep into a system that doesn't understand autism. Yeah. Um, in those cases, really starting to watch for those signs of masking and reminding your children, hey, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. Right. Instead, let's come up with what strategies you want other people to use in that moment. Right. Um, and obviously that conversation is going to be different depending on what somebody's receptive and expressive language level is. Um, I don't want to make any assumptions on cognitive level based on those two things, but like yeah. we want to make sure that we are able to 
that the child is able to understand what we say and is able to express what they're come up with words to be able to express it to the people around them so they don't have to curb those behaviors they can say hey I'm not being supported in this right and And let me can I stop you for a second what advice do you have for people who have more communication difficulties because I think a lot of people think that non-speaking people can't self-advocate well that's messed up (laughs) (laughs) sorry (laughs) (laughs) but so you know what what are your thoughts we're looking at the same things that we would do with the young child, right? Where we're responding to those behaviors in a, in a similar way. Obviously, I want people to have AC devices at that yeah. point. Like, but barring that, because I know. It's still a barrier. It's still, there are many barriers. Uh, it, when so many people still believe that you need to be able to show picture correspondence before you can have a device. Right. Like that's. I know how prevalent that still is. Yeah. Um, so like barring that, we're still responding to those behaviors. And at that point, I really hope that a parent, and I re- recognize that if you're, you're just now, th- or if you're there and you've been trying to do it from a behavioral standpoint that you're, you're having to change, that this might have an effect where you feel like you need to change the way you're doing things. And I think that those feelings of overwhelm are probably going to be pretty big for you if you're one of those people. (laughs) Um, But getting back to reading those, um, those behaviors and grounding to your environment um, so that you can recognize what your child is going through in that moment and responding to those things. And I realize that that's really hard if they are screaming, because then that's also overwhelming or if they're coming at you then maybe you need to get away for a moment so you can even do any of that work and maybe you're not gonna be able to do that in that moment but maybe you can dissect it after the fact to figure out okay what was going on at that moment so that I can then know that next time this happens these are the supports I need to have in place this is what I need to grab. This is what I need to have on hand so that this doesn't happen in the future. Um, it's still taking a very ABC approach to things, but like not doing it to curb the behavior, doing it to figure out what those supports are needed. Right. Um, right. What was the barrier or the missing skill or the stressor? Right. All those things come into play. And like I, um, and I realized that that is huge because it's, asking you to really both be in the present and be there for your child. And that those two things can be really hard to do, but um, it's for the betterment of your child. Yeah. Because once they can know that they are safe in your environment, then they don't have to bottle things up to that point. Right. Um, and especially because what we see more of, especially in, as we get into the middle school and high school years is, well, he goes from zero to 60 in like half a second. I'm like, no, no, no. That's not what happened there. Right. That was the final straw, right? Yeah. That's the last point. Yeah. We missed a lot of things up to that point. So yeah. really being observant of the small changes in behavior right maybe that shifting away in your seat maybe that glancing over and looking outside the side of the eyes all these little bitty indicators that are just chalked up to autistic behavior but usually are our communication of discomfort yes yes and and you know so that's a great example of why you can't always look at what immediately happened. Well, most of times you can't look at what immediately happened as the cause right. for, you know, a so-called behavior. Like BCBAs even call these pre-setting events um, is what I've come to learn is their term for it. But like, we all know that there's this, this buildup that can happen and sure that last thing is going to cause a behavior, but like all these other things were also causing the behavior. Right, right, right. 
And it, then it just became too much and yep. it had to be released. Yeah. And so, and that's what we typically, that like all that before that was attempts to mask. Right. To hold it together. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so like somebody may still look visibly autistic, but still have masking abilities of not showing that ramp up with behavior because the result is not getting the m and m right right and or not getting the praise or the interaction with the person around you and right which is you know um it's a punishment to not get those yeah yeah the other thing that this reminds me of is that um and, and judy endo had ironically uh, talked about this a while ago, and I just saw it shared again from someone else on Facebook. Um, like all of the accommodations that autistic people or other neurodivergent people make for everyone else all day long aren't really acknowledged. No, they're not. They're <laughs> so, so not. Um, and like, and we have to, because we, we have to. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that you've noticed this online that there are, that when autistic people type up and they're trying to um, explain their thought process, it ends up being like four or five paragraphs long. Yeah. And that is all an accommodation for the opposite end, just to be understood. Right. And like, that is what that is. That is a pure example of an accommodation that autistic people make because y'all can't relate to us. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So let's talk about the double empathy problem. Yes. Yes. Because that is exactly what we're talking about there is that <laughs> we have, we have come to the conclusion that we know that you are not going to understand us. Yeah. And then we, who are the ones with the disabilities in executive functioning <laughs> and have so much different experience of life mm -hmm. and somehow still put everything into words that y'all understand <laughs> yes i i mean i <laughs> i feel like i'm still learning every day about you know how i can be a better parent and a better friend and a better ally you know to the autistic community and and you know, the more I've thought about it, it's like part of the DSM is, you know, difficulty with um, communication and, Which you is know, not a difficulty with communication. It's really a difficulty of organizing your thoughts and planning them out. And right, right. <laughs> Which right. is like the functioning thing, not even. <laughs> right. And, okay. you know, a speech disability is a motor. Right. Thing. So, like, you know, again, it's much more complex than the, you know, uh, surface descriptions that are yes. provided, but, um, you know, it's again, the, the burden has been put on the disabled person. Right. And so, you know, even in, in talking about theory of mind and things like that, clearly holistic people also have difficulty reading the thoughts and feelings. And I mean, we have to support that too. Like it, that doesn't even get into the double empathy problem. It just, just into theory of mind problem or theory of mind um, research shows that holistic people don't understand autistic people. Actually, I'm going to go very, I'm, I'm actually going to change that and say neurotypical people because okay. I, there's not any research that shows that neurodivergent um, people don't understand us that that doesn't that research doesn't exist yet so I don't want to okay okay <laughs> because <laughs> because there's some parallels between ADHD and autism that mean that sometimes we can relate easily to ADHD right and so I don't want to I just don't want to make that assumption because there's no research to support it <laughs> right, right um can I read you a quote and yes. get your thoughts on this okay so this is from the autistic science person I saw this the other day um Okay, so this was a, a, a blog post that they made. 
In order to be seen as a legitimate researcher, especially as a graduate student, you must give in to the pathologized medical model of autism spectrum disorder. Because if you don't, your work will not be taken seriously. This is a catch-22 even for autistic people who are doing autism research. It is very difficult to work within a system that automatically devalues autistic thinking and the autistic perspective, no matter the objective measurements. It will take some truly rebellious and persistent researchers to change the autism research field into something that won't make autistic people feel less than, othered, and deficient. It also requires reviewers of grants to support neurodiversity and also reject the pathologized model of autism. And to be honest, I'm not sure it's currently possible to change this thinking within the system. We autistic people are whole human beings, not just two lines in a textbook. We are not communication difficulties, repetitive behaviors, or poor theory of minds. We are people. The more that allistic people see that, the better chance we have of changing their minds. Wow. That is a lot of level, levels of intense. <laughs> yeah. And they're not wrong. Um, I mean, minus double empathy problem um, and Milton's research and then the further research that has happened in the past few years. I don't know anything that looks at autism through a neurodiversity model from a research perspective. You have to come from that basis of, um, you always have to come from the basis of pathologizing. Um, there's a little bit in disability studies that mm -hmm. you can do neurodiversity, but that's still not, that's not, um, qualitative or quantitative research that is that's just rhetoric <laughs> and like that's the only place that you get to do it from is is anything rhetorical or rights oriented or disability studies oriented um everything else is that focus on how are we making this thing go away yeah like yeah. um and like clearly with with FDM and creating that model, I don't even know how I'm going to get it researched. Like it's research based in that I used a ton of research to come to the conclusions to create it. Mm -hmm. But like, how do you even take a framework um, that looks at all the pieces like it, like FDM does and research it because it's not about fixing autism. Right. It's not, it, it will never be that. Um, right, it's about accommodating. Yeah. And not just accommodating, but like getting into like self-advocacy and self-understanding. Self right. Um, because after we've got the basic foundations, then you still have to build on that to show, to help an autistic child realize, hey, I can get my needs met by asking. Right. Except sometimes they can't because we live in a system of people that don't believe that these supports are needed, except as rewards. Um, yeah. yeah, there's really, I mean, there's a lot of systemic change that's needed. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if, I mean, and like, I would, I would say, I, I would, I, I do know that like there are behavioral rep or changes that happen because of being supported, but like that should never be the primary measure to begin with. And like, I, I don't. <laughs> right. Right. And really when it comes down to it is that, you know, the goal should be to have, um, a ha a happy, you know, healthy in terms of, you know, mental health and autonomous. And, you know, what's that? Autonomous. Yes. Yes. Autonomy. And, um, again, you know, this is something that, uh, I actually spoke to Alfie about. Oh. Sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, the, okay. um, secure attachment is what yes. we're thinking about. Yes. With, yes. With healthy. Like, yeah. Yes. And I don't mean, I don't mean healthy in terms of yeah. Like, I don't want the disability community to take that from me as, you know, healthy is better than, you know, if people have chronic illness and things. Yeah, um, no. I, I don't mean that at all. I just mean, 
in terms of, you know, the person's well being being cared for. Yeah. Um, and you know, something that I spoke to Alfie Cohn about a few months ago was autonomy versus independence and what a difference that is. Yeah. And it really, you know, if you, if you start out from the, the, um, from the premise that you want your child or yourself to be autonomous, to be able to, you know, may have choices and make decisions that you feel are important and, you know, aligned with your own values, that's a lot different than, um, being independent and being able to maybe do things on your own, but it's not things that you would maybe have chosen. Right. And like, I realize that that is a general problem with parenting Mm -hmm. and not even autism related, like how many parents push their kids to get into ballet or soccer or whatever else, because that's what they, because of feeling like your child is an extension of yourself right and having a hard time disconnecting that um so like i i I recognize that that comes from internal values more so than it even comes from yeah uh, yeah that's very true and like the family culture and yeah yeah so can i ask you about neurodiversity because there's still a lot of confusion about the term. <laughs> I mean, when you use it for like three different layers of things, that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so neurodiversity and like, I really, really love Nick Walker's um, breakdown of it. Yeah. Uh, we'll share or, that. We'll share that in the links so people can see it. Um, her, her stuff around it is amazing um so but like so base level neurodiversity is that all brains are different and it's a normal part of human experience to have different um forms of um brains that's all base level neurodiversity is there's a variety of brains it's analogous to, to biodiversity. There's many, many different types of, uh, of life. Right. Um, then we get into the neurodiversity paradigm, which is the next layer down, which is that um, because brains and a variety of brains are part of the human experience, they are all equally valid and should be supported as if they were valid. And this is where we get a breakdown where people are like, well, does that mean that we want to, or that we leave a child alone? Well, no, we still want growth in a child. That's, it's not about a child right. being left to their own devices and being brought up by wolves in, in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing that. We are still, obviously we're still gonna have inputs of what we want for culturally and what we want, right. um, like all, all the knowledge that we want an autistic child to learn is still there. We mm-hmm. just want to support it so that we're not having to worry about the level of discomfort that comes from having a meltdown. Um, right. Like nobody wants to have a meltdown. That's not a thing that exists. It's right. really, really draining. Like, and I don't, why would we want that as an end product? <laughs> like even autistic people, like, no, that that's really uncomfortable. Have you ever yeah. experienced a meltdown from the inside? Probably not. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I have. I mean, I, I, I mean, definitely have. And like, it shuts me down for a couple of days afterwards because it's so intense. Yeah. Like I need a couple of days to recover from that before I can even move on. And yet we expect kids to be able to have the meltdown have a small break and then go back to what they're doing like right no no that's not a thing (laughs) we can ease back in but like we've got to ease back in um and then below that we have um the neurodiversity movement which are activists that are trying to get people to 
follow a neurodiversity paradigm in the way that we educate and treat and and I mean treat in a general term not as a medical term <laughs> Um, and support autistic people and not just autistic people, but anybody with neurodivergence. Um, neurodivergence isn't just autism, it's ADHD, it's bipolar, it's schizophrenia, it's um, fibromyalgia is also like, we've got epilepsy and traumatic yeah. brain injury and all these things are neurodivergence because they are all things that make our brains diverge from that bell curve <laughs> right right exactly uh, so so if you i would like for you to address this so a lot of people think that people with higher support needs are not encompassed as neurodiversity what would you like to say to that they're the ones that need it the most yeah I can live my life. I, I don't have to be doing any of this work. I could go get a job doing something else. Right. And people are going to generally treat me decently. Because I appear closer to neurotypical than... someone that's non-speaking and needs a support person around the clock. Right. I already get autonomy. <laughs> yeah. They don't. And they should because they're human beings that have that unalienable right to the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> like, <laughs> this, like baseline constitutional rights that somebody has decided because they have higher support needs, they don't get to have that. And like, they are the ones that need it the most. Right. Because we want them to be able to say, hey, this person is abusing me and be believed. Right. In whatever form they can say it in. I say, say, I'm not talking about spoken language. I am talking about communication. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I want them to be able to report when somebody is abusing them, I want them to be able to report when they feel uncomfortable and be believed. Mm -hmm. They are who needs neurodiversity the most because the alternative is living a life under the direction of others yeah. for the rest of their life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's sit with that because, wow, that is not what any of us would want. No. And it's a terror that that would be like everyone saying, well, their quality of life. I'm like, yeah, their quality of life is diminished by not having autonomy. Yeah. And I don't want that for them. I could never want that for them. One of my children is them. Me too. That and child why... speaks, but that is not able to communicate as well as everyone else. And like the, getting better, getting a lot better as luckily we're heading towards 18. And I'm just so thankful that everyone that's doing, all three of my kids are going through their FIEs right now at the same time. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so <laughs> talking to lots of people, but like team doing this one's evaluations are like, they've been able to self-advocate throughout the whole diagnostic process. I'm like, that's just so great because like for so long, not being able to recognize when a break was needed. Right. Not being able to recognize that this is making them uncomfortable. Right. The fact that they can say, hey, I'm done with this conversation now is amazing. And I'm so happy that finally to the point of that, because they're going to need support for the rest of their lives. And yeah. I want them to be able to do that 
the way that they need to. Right. They, I want them to live their life because they have that right as a human being. Yeah. So what would be, what would be your, your biggest advice to uh, parents whose child is just getting diagnosed? Okay, especially those first few weeks. Don't act. Don't just act because everyone has told you to. Like really remember that your child is still that person that they were three weeks ago, right? three months ago. And all those happy things that you always love doing with your child that now has been tainted by this, but your behavior, their behaviors, no, no, no. They are still that child. Yeah. And sit, reconnect with them as that child and not as that diagnosis anymore. Because they are a beautiful autistic child, just as they are. Yeah. And then once you've done that, you can, you can start to figure out what is it that you want for them. Don't, not right now, I mean in 20 years. And you can start to curve, carve out the plan that you need based off of what you want for them as an adult. Right. Um, and I know it can seem like such a disconnect between what you see with a three-year-old or a two-year-old and a 20-year-old, but you had your ideas of what you wanted for them before that. How, and then m coming up with that plan that respects where they're at, what they need, and then moves forward. Because if you have that baseline of knowing what you want, then it's a lot easier to say no to the things that you don't. Right. And so many people are like, you've got this window of time, like two weeks is not going to disrupt that. <laughs> Right. And you, you know, be, feeling forced into things isn't helpful for anybody. And no. when we're under stress or anxiety, and it, we it, can't make the stress. decisions either. And it's such a stressful time because, yeah. because you're, especially when they say to do this and then they're like, okay, you've got to do this and this and this, and you feel rushed to get all that done. Do not feel like you have to do that in that moment that two weeks is not going to make or break your child. Actually, it might. <laughs> if you're <laughs> rushing into things, it might break your child. Yeah. Um, yeah. But having that really, start to get that really clear understanding of just what it is that you have always wanted. And a lot of people, parents will say, I just want them to be happy. Well, yes. Go with that. Go with that thought. You don't have to have a end goal of being able to live on their own or go to college or anything like this. Happiness is a good goal. Yeah. Feeling accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to get into relationships if they want. Yeah. These are all great goals that people don't like, oh, I want them to get married and have kids. Okay. That's a good goal too. Like, that shift to going deep into these other options doesn't ever take that into account. And actually most of the time it doesn't take that into account because the assumption is made that autistic adults don't get married. They don't have kids. They don't have jobs. Right. You can't know that at two or three. Right. Like even the research that went into DS, um, before DSM-5 um, with DSM-4 showed that the outcomes of speaking autistic kids who didn't speak before the age of three versus those that did were pretty 
similar, which is why they went to the combined diagnostic instead of having Asperger's syndrome being separate because the only measurable thing was speaking before the age of three. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, wow. But like the, the measures show that even at that age, if you're non-speaking, that does not mean that your and your outcomes are so different from somebody with Asperger's syndrome. Right. In fact, I've seen research that shows that outcomes are highly dependent on parental outlook. Yes. So, you know. So what do you want for your child and like make that happen? come up with a plan to make that happen a little bit at a time. Like um, one of those things that people talk about is being able to, or that people act like is a really hard or don't, I guess people don't even think about it, but like cooking as an adult or eating what you want as an adult. Well, how do you make those measurable steps? Because most people don't start talking about feeding themselves like making meals and such until you're doing transition paperwork to get out of high school. Right. Well, all of those things that you, that most kids learn between the ages of four and 16 <laughs> that set them up to be able to prepare a meal. Yeah. We don't even discuss it. Like yeah. being able to use a toaster or a microwave at five to eight are things that you can still work on with your kid. <laughs> right. But you have to know that you want them to be able to prepare their own meals as an adult <laughs> to even think about working on it then. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a great point. <laughs> <laughs> so like, what is it that you want your child to be able to do as an adult and make the plan to get there? Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. So, okay. So final thoughts on April and um, just maybe you could also leave final thoughts for providers um, who are in this field, who are making these diagnoses. Um, what advice do you have for them too to help autistic people not feel pathologized? Because it's not, you know, I'll make the note that it's not intentional that, you know, most providers I think are, you know, wanting to help and wanting to, um, well, now uh, you tell me what your thoughts are because <laughs> <laughs> maybe you disagree. I mean, generally speaking, people that work with autistic kids are helping professionals, right? Mm -hmm. They're the helping professions. So like everyone wants to help. Yeah. I'm using that very broadly. I don't actually believe everyone wants to help. And <laughs> like, <laughs> we know that there's some people that are in it because of other reasons, but like, for the most part, people just want to help. Um, and I get that. And I think one of the bigger things is to get away from diagnosing autistic traits, autistic deficits. I realize that we have to have those in there because we have to do ADOS or we have to do ADIR or we have to do any number of other things but like instead of just focusing on that especially if you have a multidisciplinary team which I know is a rarity when we're actually doing evaluations <laughs> usually we have an LSSP or some other diagnostician doing the bulk of it and then bring in the a few other things um, but like looking at even from the young ages executive functioning um, profiles and sensory profiles and figuring out those things so that we can get away from these negative behavioral stereotypes into what the core issues are. Um, and also when you're writing up your evaluations, 
doing it from a neutral standpoint instead of even a strength space or I don't I don't like strength space by the way um okay. a lot of people do um but uh I I feel like if you say there's strengths then you automatically saying there's weaknesses and like that then still just pathologizes it just in a euphemistic way instead of right right so I like I I prefer a very neutral of uh, these are this is what's happening here's what we can do to help these areas and really taking things from a approach of this is how somebody's brain functions but it's not bad mm-hmm. and that's and that can be hard to to write an evaluation like that um it is actually the last thing that um, people have to do within the fdm professional course is learn how to rewrite an evaluation based off of (laughs) wow that's great like it it also means it doesn't get done half the time because we don't do grades or anything (laughs) 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 but like that is the last part of of our courses is coming up with your accommodations and coming up with your goals from a helping somebody to support or helping to support somebody and then um, helping somebody learn how to get the support themselves. And then the evaluation has to be in a pro neurodiversity model that just, that takes a neutral tone to all the characteristics that you're saying. Yeah. Um, And it's a hard thing. Like it's a hard shift. Um, And I think, or that's why like the court, the course for that um, really sets you up to have that mind shift that a lot of people don't, and that you don't get anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, that is really the, the biggest thing is doing that because then you're not setting up parents to thinking of all these things that need to be fixed. Yeah. You're helping set up, these are all the things that need to be changed in the environment. Yeah, and really coming at it from that environmental shift, uh, a UDL look, right? Different instruction look, all these things, like all the ways that we can really take um, our education system and just flip it around mm-hmm. and be about honestly what it should be about, because it's the same thing that you do if somebody has a sensory disability. It's in, It's the same thing you do if somebody has a physical disability, but somehow when we get into our neurodevelopmental disabilities, suddenly it's about changing the person instead of changing the environment. Yeah. And I know that's not always been the case. I know that there's a history within blind community and deaf community and so forth of that they've had to fight to get it done to where they're no longer trying to expect normalcy from them as well but like at this point most of the work with that needs to be done within the neurodevelopment neurodevelopmental realm um because we teach how to use a cane how to use um the tools for braille and all that within schools with and then deaf people have their deaf schools with sign language and all this and then obviously immersion in their culture that we don't necessarily get with autistic people. Yeah. Um, but like, so I'm not saying that that's not been there historically as what has been the focus, but a lot now is not about changing and more about learning how to support yourself within life. Yeah. And it's something that we need within neurodiversity as well is to have that shift. Um, and it's really disheartening that that is not what what's happening even yet. Um, yeah, I so. think part of that shift, though, is speaking to autistic people, including autistic people, in decisions related to your lives and your school and your work. And you know, it's it's so important for the rest of us to really live by the disability community's mantra of nothing about us without us, because it's not, 
it's not fair for, you know, non-autistic people to be making all of the decisions and deciding what's important for autistic people. Like we have World Autism Day coming up. Yes. And now I will say 10 years ago, it was much worse than it is now. Because now we know that we can have autistic people go speak at the UN. 10 year, yeah. years ago, that wasn't happening. Um, but it's still so dominated by parent voices and provider voices um, that it's hard to escape that. Actually, it's it's impossible to escape that. And every year it gets a little bit earlier. Um, like I know that this year and the past few years, I saw ramp up to autism acceptance or autism awareness month mm -hmm. at the end of January as people were sporting or like having shirts made and yeah. And all these things are reaching into the early part of the year and you can't escape it. Like, yeah, it's on your Facebook feed. It's on your Twitter. It's on your TikToks. <laughs> and tell me from your perspective, why has Autism Awareness Month or just in general been difficult and or harmful for autistics? The so historically, obviously, especially before Autism Speaks attempted their rebrand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure how, or I know that most of us don't believe in their rebrand because their research dollars still don't support what they say they're supporting. <laughs> but before that, it was always just so much doom and gloom about. And we still see that a lot. We don't see it coming out of maybe Autism Speaks or Autism Society anymore, but like we still have Generation Rescue and we still have National Autism Association. We still have FEET and we still have all the groups and they're just running through my head now and that's anxiety provoking. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, because it's, it's, it's about to be like, it's, it's soon. And like, I, I try to so much ignore anything that's not coming out of the autistic community for April, because it still relies on, it's an epidemic. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, we need early intervention. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the signs. Okay, great. But those are all trauma responses. <laughs> yeah. So, what, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say so, um, what's something actionable that you would like to see the holistic community do? Donate to the national autistic nonprofits. We all have things that we're doing, like, um, like we all have projects that need funding that we can't get funding for because we're not part of those systems. Right. Like I realize that ASCN has probably has the most funding of the, of the three of us national organizations, but like autism women's and non-binary network has a fund to help with reparations for, um, black and brown autistics, when they're in need, they can apply for funding and get some support because yeah. we're, because of our, um, just our intersections. Um, that needs to be funded so that they can continue to, to be able to support autistic people. ASA needs to be funded because they're constantly coming out with something new for autistic community members. And some of their stuff is even really useful for your, for uh, middle school and high schoolers now that um, those kinds of things need to, especially if you're in schools, go find ASAN's materials so that you can have those as part of your transition paperwork. 
of this is something that you can that your child can access to be able to understand their what they um, can access as an adult. Those are out there now that they weren't bef before, um, and that wouldn't happen without funding towards those organizations. Um, right. So that's your biggest fun or actionable step is fund us because we are doing work that is meant to help not just autistic adults but like fdm's work most of our work is is lifespan yeah um I, because we're doing education based so it's 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 outside of activist spaces like we're not doing policy work we're just trying to give a model that's better <laughs> Right, right. Foundations of yes, literally. <laughs> yes, it's literally the name of it is foundation <laughs> um, of divergent minds, like creating that foundation. And the thing about that is that it doesn't have to be an age group. That is just something that all autistic people need is support in those realms. Yeah. To create that foundational support. Like that's the whole point. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is speak up when you see holistic people trying to dismiss us. Yeah. Um because you I know that you may not know all the nuance of what you should be saying there but just showing up and saying, no, 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 you really need to listen to this person is sometimes enough because yeah. it, it can be very, very lonely to speak up and know everyone is going to disagree with you. Mm -hmm. But also you can't just not because there are kids that are affected by this. Like every single one of those people that is saying those negative things. Yeah. There's a kid that's impacted by that. Yeah. At least one. Because they wouldn't be in that space saying those things if there was not somebody in their life that was affected by what they're saying. Yeah. Um, so those are the two biggest ones, but yeah. <laughs> that, it, I really appreciate it. It's, I feel like it's an ongoing process to continue the growth that is needed to really be like an inclusive community. Yeah. Um, so any, any other, uh, final thoughts <laughs> yeah one other final thought is there are autistic people working in all areas of autism seek those people out mm -hmm. like you don't need to find your token person to support what you're you're saying within your your circle like i know a lot of providers really like taking or bring in somebody that they used to to service to say that what they're doing is great and good and mm -hmm. so forth that's creating an echo chamber there are people that work in your field whatever field it is that is autistic and doing the activist work yeah that can bring that can actually come in and and educate yeah um that. I know I would personally love to see more school systems invite autistic people to speak and, you know, talk to the school community because I don't, you know, most autistic kids don't even get to see autistic adults in school or really anywhere else, you know, un unless you're seeking groups out, which, <laughs> yeah. you know, might, are, are not necessarily hard to find either. Or not necessarily easy to find. Um, but would you agree? Because a lot of this oh, is really yeah. about representation and you know, kids seeing kids seeing people like themselves is important. When 
the older two were little and I was working at ASAN and we were getting ready to go to a treat. (laughs) (laughs) So there were 10 autistic people in my house. Minus my kids. Um, Okay. And they came home. It was summer. They came home from summer school, came inside and came up, introduced themselves to all the people around because most of them had come in from the plane and like my my house was just centrally located from BWI. Uh, so it was a good congregating place before we set off. Right. And I said to them, they're all autistic like you. And it was, oh, cool. That's so awesome. Okay, bye now. <laughs> <laughs> But because of that, there's always been that sense of pride around our neurology because it's never been hidden. It's not something that we like right. deeply talk about, except if there are needs that aren't being supported, um, then we talk about what those are and then how we can get them supported and that kind of thing. But like overall, it is just a fact that we are autistic to the point that one of my kids didn't even realize it was unusual and that there is only the small percentage of the population that's autistic had no clue thought it was <laughs> a normal thing that and like obviously it is a normal thing that just normally occurs but like right. didn't realize it's like two percent of the population right not the <laughs> because, majority <laughs> because and like they knew that it wasn't the majority but they didn't realize just how few people are autistic because they just have always been around autistic people right um it's like deaf culture it's like little people culture it's like blind culture like if you have that community around you then then that shapes the way that you perceive yourself like um Stephen Cap first paper um autism deficit difference or both I think. Oh, yeah. Um, looked at um, the outcomes of just knowing about neurodiversity and like how much of a positive perception that meant that you had on your children, with your children. Um, like, and I'm pretty sure that that was the first piece of neurodiversity research that ever came out was Stephen's paper. Oh, wow. um, And, but yeah, just having that knowledge of neurodiversity was enough to like suddenly see your kids in a positive light. And that automatically makes for better outcomes. And we know that from like, not just autism research, but like dyslexia research and ADHD research and all that also looks at that, um, that baseline understanding of, or baseline acceptance. Yeah just has such a difference on outcomes. So like, uh, yes, so much, find the autistic community in your area because it exists. It, well, it exists if you're in a city. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in a rural area, you may have a little bit more difficulty, but like there are, but even with that um, rural area still really feeds into the overall community within your state as well. Um, so like it's out there you just have to find it and then from there being supported but like there's even companies out now where you can hire an autistic adult to um to be a mentor to your autistic kid oh that is very cool um they're most of these things are pretty small you have to look for them and find them but like they exist okay (laughs) That's, I mean, I love that concept and hopefully more of those will grow and, you know, continue. Yeah, it's, to... it's always been something I've, I've always hoped would happen. And now, and I finally saw uh, a business a couple of weeks ago that, that does that. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. I'm so happy now <laughs> because it's something that's been needed. And I mean, most anybody that's autistic and doing like the big activist work, we know that there's so many things that could be done should be done but none of us have the spoons for it so it's always nice when somebody else pops up and can yeah (laughs) yeah perfect well it was such a pleasure and such a 
I, I feel so fortunate to be able to, to do all of the interviews that we do, but it really is very um, important to me to be able to speak to you and other people in the autistic community. And we so appreciate your advocacy efforts and your, you know, everything that you do to help all autistic people, not just yourself. And you deserve to be here. You just, you, <laughs> I, I really mean it. Um, I really admire everything that you do. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Jen. It, yeah, I, I realize that I don't feel like I deserve to be here, but clearly I can keep up. <laughs> Yes, you did good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.